I'd like to call to order the special meeting of the Boulder, Boulder Valley Board of Education. I'd like to clarify on the record that the Board of Education has issues to discuss in executive session. But first of all, can you call the roll? Garcia. Here. Gephardt. Here. Nisnik. Here. Rajpal. Sargent. Sweeney Moran. Here. Zip. Here. Thank you. We have a motion to move into executive session. I, Stacy Ziss, make a motion pursuant to CRS 24-6-4024B to convene an executive session to confer with an attorney for the school board for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions relating to pending litigation on the following issues, federal litigation regarding race discrimination and CDE, EEOC, CCRD, OCR complaints alleging age, gender, race, and disability discrimination. All right, may I have a second? <laughs> Roll call. Garcia. Yes. Gephardt. Yes. Nisnik. Yes. Rajpal. Sargent. Sweeney Moran. Yes. Ziss. Yes. Motion passes. I'd like to call to order this work session of the Boulder Valley School Board of Education. Laura, could you please call the roll? <coughs> Garcia. Here. Gephardt. Here. Nisnik. Here. Rajpal. Sargent. Here. Sweeney Moran. Ziss. Here. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Dr. Anderson, but congratulations again, Bill, for your long list of accolades. We're truly honored to have you as our CFO and guiding us through turbulent financial times, so thank you. But Dr. Anderson, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Board President Gephardt, members of the board. Uh, this evening, we have our CFO, Bill Sutter here. He's going to walk us through the second quarter financials and mid-year analysis. Board members, as a reminder, we had some reporting issues, so this report's coming to you a little bit later than it typically does, uh, but the content is the same. There isn't a presentation. I don't know if we're going to present if board members have the actual heart document in front of them, um, you could pull it up in board docs if not. Yeah, it's attached to the agenda. And it's attached to the agenda. And so with that, I'll, I'll, um, I'll turn it over to Bill. All right. Th thank you, uh, President Gephardt, members of the board, Dr. Anderson. Uh, <clears throat> we'll walk through the second quarter financials. Uh, first, uh, we did have the opportunity uh, a couple of weeks ago to uh, go through this with the audit committee, uh, as is our standard practice. Uh, as Dr. Anderson mentioned, we uh, are a little bit behind schedule, about a month or so uh, from when we typically do this update uh, to the board in February. Uh, as our uh, audit was a little delayed, uh, uh, so is this round of uh, financial updates. So, uh, this really is a very typical activity uh, for the middle of the year. Um, there are detailed uh, notes uh, to the funds that are included uh, in the financial statements. Um, so those are available within the, the financial statements that are attached. They're also on the website. Uh, there's, I don't know, 15 odd years worth of quarterly financials on the website if anybody really wants to go back and uh, spend some time reading those. but. Um, I will go through and mention uh, some specific funds, uh, uh, and uh, I'll skip over a couple that are um, either don't have any particular uh, activity that's worth referencing, but certainly am able to answer any questions. So first, we'll start out uh, with the general operating fund. That's on pages uh, six through eight. Uh, so. Uh, just one little reminder, the uh, technology fund that we used to report separately uh, was rolled into the general operating fund last fiscal year. We included it uh, in the general fund last at the year-end close last year, but it's included within the general fund in these statements. Uh, for revenue collections, 95% uh, of our property taxes are collected in the second half 
uh, of the fiscal year. So the board uh, certifies those mills, mill levies in December, and then those collections start coming in. Um, and so there's, there's very little uh, revenue collection on property taxes in the first half of the year. Um, the property tax number that's included in here, uh, particularly for uh, the first line, the current property taxes, that's the, uh, the School Finance Act portion of, um, uh, of lo local revenues. And that does include the statutory uh, mandated increase to 27 mills. Uh, the uniform mill uh, was how it was referenced when it was passed a couple of years ago. Uh, this is up from 26.023 mills in the prior year and 25.023, which is what it had been for uh, over a decade uh, prior to that. So again, this is a, a, an action by the state legislature to correct a mistake by the Department of Education that had been lingering for quite some time, uh, but uh, it is, we are now at the maximum required uh, under current law. Uh, for that uh, local portion of the School Finance Act. From the expenditure side, uh, obviously the general operating fund is largely staff costs, um, and uh, we're on track with expectations uh, and budget, uh, although there is some underspending uh, as the labor shortage continues uh, to prove challenging both in uh, staff turnover uh, as well as uh, just delayed hiring. For non-personnel expenditures, uh, timing matters when you're looking at the current year uh, and potentially comparing that to the prior year as either a percent spent or just a, a raw dollar amount. Uh, and also uh, can be a difference between the two years if there is a uh, particularly large uh, one-time expenditure that was included in the prior year or the current year uh, that has been uh, uh, transacted. Um, so, or just the timing, again, from uh, some transactions might have occurred in the prior year in December, and it happened in the first week of January this year. I don't have an exp a specific example, uh, but those are the kind of things that can uh, show up as differences uh, in year-to-year uh, -year comparisons. Uh, we are continuing to participate in the state interest-free loan program, uh, although at a lower amount than previous years, I think our maximum that we uh, we're authorized to borrow was about 120 million. I think we're down to 85 million is what we're borrowing now uh, to be able to um, smooth out our cash flows uh, as, uh, as we get those property taxes in the second half of the year. Uh, the transfers to other funds um, are, the, so this is how some of the other accounting funds uh, get the resources to um, provide the services or activities that are included in those risk management, athletics, uh, preschool are, are some examples there. Uh, so those were halfway through the year. We do those monthly, monthly uh, transactions, so those are all uh, right on, on track there. The uh, differentiated funding, uh, differentiated funds, funding fund, fund uh, is uh, on page uh, nine. Um, this does not include the six high support schools. Those are included in the ESSER three funds and the grant fund, uh, but this is the uh, targeted support and um, targeted support, what's the other? Flexible support. Um, and so uh, the hiring and turnover that I mentioned uh, has impacted some of the spending uh, there uh, as well uh, as they're Im implementing those uh, plan programs. With athletics, uh, the collect which is on page 10, uh, collections for participation fees are back on track. We did have a little shortfall uh, in the prior year as we uh, changed how those were collected and uh, was also sort of uh, just in the transition back from um, uh, putting some of the athletic programs back in place after they had been uh, on hiatus a little bit. So anyway, uh, the athletics uh, is back on track and those participation fees are uh, in accordance with expectations. Uh, the preschool fund on page 11, uh, just a reminder that this is the last year of the Colorado preschool program as we transition to the new 
uh, universal uh, preschool program. Uh, and uh, we're still getting information, uh, even though this is a sort of forward-looking uh, thought for next year. Um, it is, there have certainly been some challenges getting information out of the state. Their website has gone down and gone back up and been fixed and people had to reapply and uh, it's been challenging to say the least. Uh, so this first year that we'll experience next year um, uh, will be um, a little bumpy from a, from a financing standpoint uh, as we all get used to uh, a very different way of uh, students engaging with uh, us as a system when we're used to having it go through open enrollment or just regular enrollment. This is uh, a system that is entirely controlled uh, at the state level uh, or at the uh, LCO, local um, authority that, that is managing uh, both the uh, school district and the private providers. Uh, I was going to make a comment earlier when I started. Uh, I will include a few um, prognostications of next year uh, as I go through some of this. Um, the mid-year, uh, the second quarter financials in the mid-year is really uh, kind of where we're uh, starting to look forward into next year, um, how things are on track and what is shaping up uh, for next year as well. So not just a, a singular look back at the first uh, half of the year, uh, but also a little look forward. Um, community schools on page 13 uh, were almost back to uh, pre-pandemic levels uh, through the middle of the year, uh, 4.8 million in revenue and 3.4 million in expense. Um, there's a transfer from community schools into the general fund, so halfway through the year we've transferred 100,000 of the 200,000 back to the general fund uh, that is planned for this uh, current budget year. Um, let's see. The, um, just like the universal preschool program, uh, our enrichment program to go along with that is expanding significantly within community schools. Uh, so that will, again, start to show up next year um, as we're providing those complementary uh, supports for the um, second half of the, of the week. Um, uh, child care for, for working families. Food services fund on page 17. Um, we did resume the transfer uh, from the general fund to the lunch program this year, 1.7 million. Uh, we were able to take a pause on that for a couple of years uh, as uh, during the pandemic when uh, the free lunch was provided um, uh, at the federal level. Um, the transfer is expected to grow into next year um, for the free meals for all program. Um, just a reminder that they are free to the student or family, uh, but they are costing the district. Uh, it's an expansion of a, uh, the program, and the reimbursement rate that is being provided is less than the current paid rate uh, for a meal. Uh, so we're uh, looking forward to some of the volume making up uh, for some of that uh, deficit. Uh, but as we all know, food and labor costs are outstripping uh, the reimbursement, which has no adjustment for inflation uh, as of yet. Uh, participation is key uh, for the program next year. So if we're collecting less revenue uh, and participation doesn't increase, that imbalance will grow. Uh, so doing all that we can to uh, increase the participation, uh, making sure that families are filling out the uh, free and reduced lunch forms, because that is also key to the program, uh, is that uh, on a statewide basis, uh, the, the projections uh, necessitated the maintaining of at a minimum or increasing the number of lunches that are provided uh, free by the feds uh, to, to reduce the amount that uh, the state has to put in. So if that doesn't happen, uh, the, the revenue for this uh, might not be uh, there at the, the statewide level. 
there are definitely efforts underway at the federal level, the National School Lunch Association, or, uh, Food Service uh, Association um, is leading efforts at the federal level uh, as well as ASBO International and AASA. Uh, to maintain, uh, there's a little extra reimbursement that's happening right now. Uh, it was a recognition for the supply chain and inflation issues, um, but if they take that away, the inflation has caused the prices to go up. They don't go back down magically. Um, so hopefully the, the feds, uh, the legislature, federal legislature will uh, continue that little bit extra. Uh, and also there are certainly are efforts to make this a national effort, not just a state by state. Although I suspect that there is some hope at the federal uh, Congress that uh, the more states that chip away at it, the less they have to do. Uh, and more states are starting to participate um, uh, as a, a free lunch for all program. Uh, grants, uh, so page 18 to 20. Um, just a real high-level uh, overview, but this report uh, does uh, comply with the board policy uh, DD to provide a quarterly report of an all annual uh, awarded grants. Uh, so just a, a reference that uh, that, that uh, report that's the, the quarterly financial report is the report that, that uh, meets that requirement. Um, we'll likely be making some adjustments to the ESSER 3 plan uh, just to make sure that we uh, transact all of those resources um, in a timely manner so that we don't have money left on the table because uh, that would be um, a shame uh, and um, bad on my part to give money back to the federal government uh, when we certainly have an opportunity to spend that out on um, uh, applicable and appropriate uh, programs in the current fiscal year and the next. Um, I think I mentioned math programs or the math curriculum as being an option that we could apply to that, uh, some of the remaining funds. Um, but because the curriculum is a, a five-year program uh, that includes software and consumables, although we're paying over two years, it's a five-year plan, so we actually have to expend that over five years, which means you can only count the first year of the transaction next year. Uh, so instead of $2 million-ish uh, dollars, it's only about 350000 that would be in the first year, uh, which means um, you know, making some adjustments uh, again so that we're spending all of those funds out in a timely manner. Transportation fund, uh, page 21. So hiring is better, uh, but still uh, continues to be a struggle. Um, I believe the last I saw was we have 121 routes and 122 drivers, maybe. Rob, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but is that close? 130 and 133. 130 and 133. Uh, so that's, that's better than the other way, um, uh, which it was for quite some time. Um, so uh, as the financials show, we're um, halfway through the year, 39% of the personnel budget, um, but 44% of the student contact days. So uh, it's a, there's a report at the end of the financials that I'll, I'll reference, but um, the number of days within the first half of the year and the second half of the year are a little different. Uh, so. Um, or about 44% of the what would be a paid day for uh, bus drivers in the, the first half of the year. So pacing is a little under budget uh, for personnel there. And then uh, using contracted services, um, the high school athletics and competitions, uh, so the charter buses um, and uh, some of the student busing uh, via hop, skip, drive, not via the service that's right next to our uh, bus garage over there, but uh, uh, through the, the service uh, hop, skip, drive, uh, particularly for McKinney-Vento students that have moved outside of the district, it's a way uh, to provide that transportation service in a fully authorized and, and uh, uh, applicable way, but um, uh, is an additional expense um, uh, for sure. 
So we're about uh, just under 43% of overall expenses versus 44% uh, of the contact day. So again, uh, just under uh, budget there. Operations and Technology Fund on page 22. Uh, so the one-time expenditures that are included in there, uh, so some of the software implementation, so our ERP uh, implementation, the transportation, food services, uh, those were included in there and they're pacing along uh, uh, to be on track uh, uh, for the plan that was put in place. Uh, capital investments, the $2 million annexation payment to the city of Boulder, it's in the budget, it didn't happen. Uh, until uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, so it happened in the second half of the year, but that's one of the items that's included in, in the uh, budget there. Uh, portables at Metal Arc uh, and the maintenance project. So uh, including um, within that fund uh, the uh, one-time expenses, uh, capital uh, type projects. And then on an ongoing basis, the reallocations of operations and technology expenditures from the general fund as has been our practice uh, since the uh, onset of that in 2016. Uh, and then also the allocation for the charter schools are referenced uh, in there as well. Uh, bond redemption fund on page 24. Uh, so that's our principal and interest payments for our uh, general obligation bonds. Uh, we are getting ready to issue some more of those uh, for our uh, next round of bond program uh, in another month or so. Um, moving on into the building fund, page 25. Uh, so th this historically has been referenced as the uh, 2014 building fund, uh, but we're just going to drop the date on it and it's now just the building fund. Uh, we certainly have to uh, track things separately uh, for uh, IRS reasons and arbitrage and uh, all kinds of different uh, IRS-related things, but uh, from a reporting basis, uh, we'll have all the um, all of New Vista, the, the remaining funds for that, uh, as well as the new funds and all the other projects uh, that are planned in there, uh, so merged together for reporting purposes. Uh, and then when those proceeds come in uh, in the next month or so uh, from the bond sale, uh, those will be recorded in there. Uh, obviously, we'll have minimal expenditures through the end of the fiscal year for those new bond proceeds, um, but we are starting uh, work. Rob and his team are, are starting on that already. Uh, health and Dental Fund, page 27 and 28. Uh, so they're financially operating uh, uh, okay. Uh, after two very positive years, um, the pandemic uh, certainly impacted utilization. Um, some of the, the uh, optional uh, things that folks can go get, they didn't, uh, or they just didn't uh, go visit the doctor for their annual updates and things like that. Uh, so there was uh, some uh, solid underspending. Um, but right now, uh, the latest report from our uh, insurance uh, consultant is we're running roughly 70 to $80 per employee per month uh, above the utilization is running above what the, the contribution is. So uh, we have that positive fund balance from the last couple of years to offset that, uh, but that is something that we'll have to keep an eye on going forward. Uh, renewals for next year, uh, we have a 5% district contribution as part of total compensation uh, and a 8% uh, dependent uh, increase, uh, dependent coverage uh, in line with the inflation rate uh, used for uh, the, the state uh, inflation rate. On page 29 is our schedule of investments. Uh, so this um, just is a requirement uh, as part of these financial statements, uh, but uh, with the exception of a very small dollar amount uh, that's in our uh, bank that we use for our banking services, U.S. Bank, uh, it is all contained within the local government investment pool, which is Colo Trust. Um, it's all broken out by the various buckets we'd have to maintain uh, uh, separate accounting for those things like bond proceeds are accounted for separately so that the interest uh, can get accrued uh, easily uh, for that. Um, but uh, back on, that's page six, uh, the 
uh, interest income is trending well above what the budget is. The budget for the year is 250,000 uh, through mid-year, we're at 1.2 million. Uh, so the interest rates that uh, just everybody knows uh, have gone up um, significantly. Um, the report on their 4.3% uh, was back on December 31, uh, and it's 4.82% uh, in Collar Trust today. So from a, uh, the very limited pool of investments that, that government aid, uh, entities are able to invest in, that's a really uh, solid investment return uh, for uh, the resources that are in there. So we'll be looking at how we invest our bond proceeds, whether uh, they go into something like a uh, investment pool like Hall Trust, or we create a uh, separate um, laddered investment plan with particular, um, again, those kinds of uh, investments that we can actually participate in, government securities, things like that, um, but with uh, various maturities out uh, that might actually gain us a little bit higher rate of return. So we'll be looking into that uh, as uh, we get closer to the, to the sale date. Uh, page 30, projected fund balance. Uh, so largely in line, um, we, we don't project down to the minutia of a few dollars if something is going to be different. But uh, with the exception of the general fund, we have included that uh, as um, a larger fund balance the, than was uh, built in the budget. Page 31, the very final page uh, on the personnel expenditures uh, is the, what I referenced earlier of the number of days in the year, uh, both as a comparison to the prior year, if somebody's looking at salaries in a particular line item uh, or uh, within the current year, um, there can be a number of days difference between the prior year and the current year, depending on how the calendar shakes out. Uh, so those years that uh, uh, winter break goes a little further into January, right? Those are the kind of things that can shift uh, the number of days. So uh, that can make things look different. So this is a reference to make sure that uh, folks uh, have something to, to point to if somebody is saying, well, why are you underspending the budget this year or not la compared to last year or something like that. So that is it for the second quarter financial statements. Um, I can run through the mid-year real quick or pause and if there's, there's any questions. questions. <clears throat> sure. Did he? So I see that we've got $80,000 in U.S. Bank. At, is that typical of how much we would have at any one time in a bank as opposed to investing, say, in the trust or other securities? So um, we transfer into the bank because uh, that's where paychecks go out from. That's uh, what I was thinking. The day before, right, uh, the 20 million a month um, that we're spending, um, or it's more like 15. Um, so that'll go in like literally the day before, uh, and then it usually gets transacted out very quickly thereafter. Um, that is just the you know little bit of remainders that uh, go in there. So if it's a concern of the banking industry's woes in the last week yes, or so, yes, that's why I was asking that. I didn't think we had it in there for any length of time. Correct. You know. Correct. And what is Project Serve? The that project. So the Marshall Fire was. It's so a that's um, a federal grant that is. Um, it was initially started, um, I believe, for school shootings, but they have expanded the opportunity for opportunity. Uh, terrible word uh, <laughs> for um, other traumatic experiences in schools, uh, and so we applied for that um, related to the Marshall Fire. So that's providing some resources for mental health, uh, largely, I believe. Okay, because I see we have two lines for it. One is just Project Serve, so that must be the original. If, in case there's a school shooting or something, and then there's an, the one underneath it. It's on page 18. It, it says Project Serve Marshall Fire. But those are both used for 
support services for students? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the $837 is um, or the 13000 from the prior year. Um, I have to verify what that, that particular thing is um, as opposed to the Marshall Fire, which was definitely um, related. We haven't had a school shooting in Boulder Valley. To Thank God. Thank <laughs> you. Um, is it too soon to tell what the impact, financial impact will be to the district of early childhood and the change of funding from the state? When will we know that? Because I know we're just going to have to pick it up. I don't think the state's going to give it to us. Uh, correct. <laughs> the, the state will provide the, the per pupil amount that they've identified uh, at the various LCO, because um, it's different, right, for different LCOs. Um, the, the challenge really is the, the split between the three funding sources. We used to have just two, right? We either counted a student in the pupil count, um, the student with special needs or CPP student, or they were tuition students. So they were counted or tuition students. So now we have the four-year-olds, the four-year-olds that qualify for more services, the four-year-olds that qualify for less services, the three-year-olds that qualify for services and are funded, the three-year-olds that don't qualify, and then the tuition-based uh, side. So um, we'll really have to get our uh, legs under us for a year to, to see how all that comes together. And again, because it's a cycle, um, it's unclear I believe I've heard they're making quarterly payments uh, from the, the new department. Um, so are, if a student shows up one month late, do we get the that first quarter payment? Do we only get funding in the next quarter? Or I don't know, so we'll see. I think there's uh, a lot of determination. I, Last I heard, um, Cherry Creek didn't have hardly any of their sites open because of some of those challenges with the website. Uh, so, and the state was reaching their projected number of total seats they had available. So, um, Cherry Creek's gonna have a lot of seats uh, available. So, um, no money. That would put some pressure on things, um, but it's still um, rural areas that. Uh, have been used to getting per pupil funding, uh, rural or small districts, uh, really small districts where the funding may have been uh, twelve to fourteen thousand dollars a student, and now it's, it would, and they would get half of that, so six to seven thousand dollars a student, and now they're maybe getting five or six, like this. so. It'll be interesting to see how this all plays out on a statewide basis. Will we have at least some sense in the fall? Oh yes, I mean, as we're getting the enrollments processed, um, because it's the uh, request for the location and then matching up that, and then are there the seats available? So this, it's a very uh, in-depth process to go through to, to shake everybody out. Um, as we get through the next uh, probably three months worth of that processing, um, we'll have the, a better handle on what sites are all filled, uh, what sites has, still have space available. Uh, and then as had been our practice for a long time related to both the CPP program and um, serving students with special needs, um, a student turns three and they show up, we start serving them. So that can be any time throughout the year. Um, so there has to be some seats available um, uh, so that's the, the biggest challenge going forward. So we don't so. know if they'll pay us for holding seats. And we also, is there, is there like an enrollment date? Like if they show up on November 1st and they're not sped, we don't know. So can we get an update, Rob, in the fall about what the funding is looking like? So I have a sense okay. that we'll have a better sense. And I'm guessing there's going to be some support the district has to reach into its general fund to support these kids. 
And certainly, I mean, the district has been putting in over $5 million a year into preschool education as it was part of the plan from the 20, which I don't remember which override even right. it was. It was the, our preschool or kindergarten yeah. override, yeah. So, um, so anyway, uh, we've been providing those extra resources. So that's where it's a challenge for those districts that haven't been doing that. Um, so we're kind of a leg up on most districts because we've already been providing those extra resources. So um, the the plan is that the uh, that there won't be uh, an additional investment needed if everything falls out correctly. So it always falls out correctly, doesn't it, Bill? Well, yes, we'll see. Um, Similar question for lunch. I assume there'll be a general fund hit because for all the reasons you identified, the state's not going to backfill if we have more kids sign up, fewer kids sign up for free and reduced lunch. There's a formula and the districts are left to pick up whatever the state doesn't pick up. Uh, yes, which has always been the case. I mean, right, if it would just whether it was the federal program that was picking it up or the, the state didn't have a, they've been picking up the uh, breakfast side of things for a while. Um, the, the difference between, I think, reduced and free anyway. Um, the, again, the challenge is were there projections of what they thought was mm -hmm. going to uh, fund this at a statewide basis enough uh, and what happens if it isn't? Um, uh, there's definitely resources at the state level if they don't decide to spend them all in the next month and a half. Um, but that's, those are largely one-time resources, and those are resources that could have gone back to general education activities uh, or funding school districts for the negative factor and all that. So there are some concerns that the, both of these programs will um, require dollars either at the state level or at the local level um, one way or the other as a, as a new mandate. If I had to guess, it'd be the local level, wouldn't you? Uh, I, I, I guess the state could come back and say, I'm sorry, we're not going to pay you the per meal amount that we said we were. We're going to pay you something less because we don't have that money. Um, but what more likely they're going to do is, yes, we'll continue to pay the $3 and whatever that, that uh, is the amount we identified, but that has to come from somewhere else. Uh, and so it's a reduction of what's available for K-12 in general. So whether it's at the local level or the state level, it's coming out of K-12. What are you thinking we'll do for using up those ESSER dollars so they're not in our bank account when the feds come knocking? Uh, we have activities in place in the current year and uh, in the planning stages for next year that would uh, uh, fit within what we've already put forth in our budget. It would just be more of that, so uh, additional teachers, um, the the VIP program, some of the one-time staff that we've put in uh, in place in the current year are things that would fit within that learning loss uh, teacher line item that we can just move things around. So these will be limited term contracts since it's one-time money, is that what you're saying? For they already are. They're, so we'll yeah. just extend those for another year? Or free up the resources that are currently Plan so that so the particularly for the high support schools those six schools we need to set those resources aside if we take it out of ESSER and free up resources in the general fund we'll take the resources out of the general fund and put all of those six schools into the differentiated funding fund uh, so that nobody loses any money uh, it's just which bucket it comes out of. And hopefully we have money in the savings bucket when Esther goes away to keep doing that, but we'll have to see. Yep. Um, 
insurance bill, is that something we're just gonna, is that part of contracts? Is that something we can just increase the cost that we're gonna be charging our staff and families? Or That was a pretty big number. So we had there. a meeting. I know we have some one-time money, but longer term? So the Benefits Committee uh, had a meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, to review the uh, financial status of the, of the fund. Uh, we get projections from uh, Hub International, which is our benefits consultant. Uh, then at this time of year, we're getting the renewals from uh, both Kaiser um, and UMR. Um, and UMR is a little different because we're just paying, that's our self-funded plan, truly self-funded plan. So we're paying whatever transactions are happening. So it's on us to project and the consultant to project what that looks like going forward into the future. Uh, for Kaiser, as a fully insured plan, Kaiser comes forward and says, we need a 15% increase. And we say, well, that's not gonna work for us. Um, and so the consultants go back and forth and uh, we had, I think we landed on 10-ish um, as an increase from Kaiser. So, uh, between, we just, we don't wanna have the rates spike and come back down from year to year, right? So this is trying to smooth things out a little bit. Uh, we have language in the employee agreements that speaks to increasing the rate, uh, the district contribution at two times inflation or 5%, whichever is less. Uh, and so that, concept of language uh, is where the 5% district contribution increase came from. And the 8% uh, dependent increase uh, is not trying to make up for that difference overall, uh, but is in line with inflation. Uh, so between both of those, we're, we'll still likely, again, it all depends on the usage, uh, be slightly underwater uh, for the fund, but because we have those couple of good years uh, that it won't be a detrimental impact. The other challenge really that we have is just the timing on uh, the whole program, right? So we are getting at this time of year, mid-ish March, uh, these renewals uh, and the projections, and we're right in negotiations and the open enrollment for uh, benefit plans is like April 10th for a month or so. So they don't align well uh, between what the renewal increase is, what n negotiated amounts are, and when people have to open enroll. So um, as we're moving forward, uh, and I committed to this to the, to the benefits committee, is we're gonna start talking much earlier. Uh, so next year is the first year of uh, implemented $25 uh, per month for the gold plan, uh, an employee contribution. Um, so most every district uh, everywhere uh, has some sort of employee contribution for their um, own benefit. Um, this is the first year we, we had planned to put it in place last year, um, but again, because of this timing challenge with employee negotiations, it got pushed off uh, for a year. So again, that's getting put into place for next year. Uh, and so we'll have to have tough conversations. We're not changing the plan design for next year, um, but we'll have to have tough conversations about do we increase that $25 per employee contribution? Do we reduce the benefits? Do we increase co-pays, right? These are all the moving, the levers you can move on the health insurance fund, but we need to have those conversations earlier uh, because right, it's challenging that there's benefits referenced in employee contracts, but there's also a reference to taking the recommendation of the benefits committee. And so uh, you can't have both. You can't say you're gonna take the, the recommendation of the benefits committee and then argue that your contract doesn't allow for that. So 
anyway, uh, it's a starting the conversation sooner uh, so that we're um, better situated earlier in the year uh, to make the recommendation and have that uh, go forward. And that $25 per employee, is that flat? Because that hits obviously bus drivers differently than it hits teachers or principals, but it's a flat amount, it's not a It is typically a ratio. flat amount uh, from what I've seen in other districts, not a percent of salary or something like that. Um, or a category if you make this much under 25,000, then you only have to pay 15. We aren't doing it like that. Um, no, or th that's not what's in place right now. It is a flat dollar amount. Um, that's there's a lot of complexity to this, right? So uh, anybody who works half time gets full benefits. So if you work half time as a starting teacher, you're making twenty five, six, seven thousand, whatever it is, uh, versus full time as a starting teacher versus half time as a senior teacher versus, so all of those complexities um, are, uh, would be challenging because you're gonna have different dollar amounts hitting the different employee groups differently, or the same employee group differently. So um, it's been brought up, it hasn't been. Yeah, I was actually brought. thinking across employee groups, not within the same employee group, thinking about the paras and the bus drivers, that it would hit them the slightly larger impact than it would hit our teachers. Right, now there is still the um, no cost to the employee plan, the silver plan that is available. So there is a no cost plan available. Just fewer to, benefits right. or higher co-pays? Yeah. Okay, that's an interesting quandary to have it be the benefits committee or by contract or you pick. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, Looking at your crystal ball, how have you have they done enough figure setting for us to get a sense of where we're going to be this year, or should we wait till your next presentation? Uh, we're going to have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's fine. It, I figured that'd be the answer. Yeah, just... there's there's been um, minimal information. Uh, the only thing I've heard um, of late is everybody's waiting for the. Uh, deadline for filing with the title board, which is like the 23rd or 4th, right, so that the referred measure, the grand plan with the governor and all that can happen. Um, so there's radio silence on a lot of fronts uh, related to that. Um, there's, uh, from the School Finance Act, quote, we're in a good place because we can pivot one way or the other and have good arguments to counter whatever comes forward. So um, that is an ind indication that people don't really know which gonna come forward, right? So uh, just that being prepared to um, uh, beat back whatever changes are suggested that might not be beneficial um, overall. Well, and it'll be interesting because aren't we headed towards almost being fully self-funded given potential property rate increases coming up? Uh, it's rapidly approaching that. So it'll be start some interesting conversations. Anybody else have any questions? All right, thank you. We'll move on to your next presentation. The mid-year, yes. The mid <laughs> uh, so this will go quickly. Uh, so. Um, the mid-year analysis is focused uh, uh, not entirely on the general operating fund, uh, but when looking at other funds, it's really uh, if there is something uh, particularly uh, of note that needs addressing either in the current year or for the next uh, fiscal year. So uh, the purpose of the mid-year analysis uh, is to monitor the current fiscal year, right? So uh, the quarterly financials are what has transacted up until that point. Uh, the mid-year analysis is taking into account the projecting out salaries and benefits uh, in the general fund in particular uh, because small percentage changes uh, can really uh, create a large dollar impact um, uh, both positively and negatively. 
uh, as to how those trends are. So that's either something that needs to be corrected in the current year or corrected in the next fiscal year if there are insufficient uh, funds available. Uh, it's also to anticipate the available year-end uh, balance uh, to fund balance to inform planning uh, going forward in the next year. Um, identify budget items that may require additional investment or restructuring in the next fiscal year. Uh, and identify opportunities for improvement uh, in our budget projections uh, for the next fiscal year. So again, it's uh, just a deep dive. Um, the process for um, horizontal movement on uh, the teacher salary schedules, we've changed that a little bit, uh, but uh, historically it's been if you turn it in by uh, October-ish, uh, you get to have that retro to the beginning of the year, and so that's hitting in like the November uh, and December payroll. So by the time we get to the December payroll, uh, folks are uh, sort of at their salary that they're going to be for the rest of the year. So that's where uh, that projecting out for the remainder, uh, the last six months of the year, um, is uh, m most beneficial to do it in the middle of the year. Uh, so some significant observations uh, from the general fund, again. Uh, total revenues projected at 100%, uh, so not under collecting or over collecting. Uh, there are uh, two lines, so over collecting in the interest, as I mentioned, uh, but under collecting in the indirect costs. Uh, the rate, the indirect cost rate was adjusted downward uh, and uh, wasn't built into the budget, so we're under collecting in some of the indirect costs uh, related to grants. So those are offsetting each other. Um, total expenditures are projected at 98.1% of the revised budget, uh, and this is uh, all within the compensation uh, area, uh, so salaries and benefits. Um, this is, again, 2%, um, and a 98, that's a uh, not quite an A plus, but you know, an, a solid A. Uh, but that's still seven-ish million dollars uh, difference uh, because of the uh, amount of salaries and benefits we have. So um, again, it's a it's a check to make sure uh, are there particular employee groups that are uh, different or jobs, uh, and then coming up with some of the. Um, uh, reasoning and rationale behind that is that uh, there are vacant positions, there are, uh, has been turnover, higher turnover than expected, so uh, attrition savings, uh, all those pieces uh, are what we start to look at uh, as we go forward into the building the budget for next year. Does that mean that we truly have uh, space available within the budget uh, to expand? Or is it just that there were vacant positions and once those are filled, so it's truly a one-time uh, savings and not an ongoing savings? Um, so again, uh, we go through uh, all funds. We ask the, the fund managers to review their funds and make sure that there's nothing uh, particularly off track uh, that would need addressing in the middle of the year. Uh, we have the identified changes there, the interest income, uh, the audit adjustment um, uh, for the CDE audit adjustment, so when they come through and the, um, count our kids, this is the 2018-19 October count and the 2017-18 transportation reimbursement. So CDE, yeah, their CDE is a tad behind in their uh, auditing. So. Uh, again, as those come through, we, we owe them money or they owe us money, uh, depending on how far we're off. But it's a very small dollar amount uh, that's in that line item. We do call it out separately. Yeah, it hasn't, oh, it's in the, it hasn't been transacted yet. $24,750. So next to nothing, or no, it's 49,000 in total, so a little bit more than the 25,000 that we have budgeted. Uh, so pretty small in the grand scheme of things. Indirect costs, as I mentioned, uh, and then no other significant variances. Uh, staff compensation, uh, just under 98%. Um, 
normal fluctuating staff costs and uh, hourly positions, um, uh, the activity of just being able to hire and maintain folks, uh, non-personnel. So uh, we always project to fully expend the non-personnel budgets. Um, we know that they won't be fully expended. Uh, there's always school resource allocation carryover. There's always textbook carryover. Um, but those are either dollars that will be carried forward into the following year and aren't really available to spend or reallocate. Um, so while we could go through the process of saying, we think we're going to underspend the SRA by $500,000, then we would need to track that going forward and make sure we don't spend that twice. Um, uh, so it's worth just saying we plan, it's budgeted, the authority exists in all the folks that manage these line items to spend those dollars. So we'll just plan that it's gonna be spent and if it isn't, it typically ends up in carryover anyway uh, and goes forward into the next year. Um, there's certainly the ability to spend between line items or object types, uh, so um, uh, equipment versus supplies versus a purchase service. So those line items aren't going to be exactly as budgeted. Um, uh, and there never should be an expectation that there is, uh, and because most um, uh, budgets are managed to the bottom line, whether it's at a school level or department level. Um, so it's, it's, uh, there's the ability to move dollars between line items. Um, no variance in reserves and then uh, growth of uh, about 7.1, million uh, additional uh, fund balance from what was budgeted. So we had a $7.2 million budgeted fund balance uh, and this will about double that. So that's the mid-year analysis that we are on track, underspending in salaries and benefits a little bit, uh, and uh, nothing looks particularly askew uh, in a negative way. Questions? Kitty? Yes, so for the indirect cost reimbursement, that's reimbursement by the state to us? Or? No, it's a it's a uh, percentage that we are allowed to charge to some grants. Um, most federal oh, grants, okay. IDEA, Title I, uh, all the title grants, um, uh, the ESSER funds. Um, so it's annually calculated. So uh, we submit all our line item transactions to the uh, to the state. Um, as part of the audit, so it's one of the pages mm -hmm. that's included in the bound audit document is this uh, comparison of year to year. So we'd send all this information to the state and the state has a calculation that creates this indirect cost rate and say this is what you can apply. There's a restricted rate and an unrestricted rate uh, and you can apply those to different grants. Some grants specifically say you cannot apply an indirect cost. Uh, some grants say you can only do it for personnel uh, and not for stuff. Um, so there's there's some rules that go wrong with indirect costs. Okay, so what percentage of our indirect costs do we typically get? Uh, it's about 5%. Okay, so not a lot. Right. And on the property taxes election, does that mean <clears throat> the override? Um, uh, correct. That is the um, the general mill levy override, as opposed to the transportation that's in the transportation fund and the operations and technology that's in that fund. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I have. Thanks. Anyone else? So, I think we heard at a presentation last week that our percentage of students qualifying for special education services have gone up some. So I'm just interested in the reimbursement number. <laughs> I'm guessing that that number from the state isn't going up despite all the rhetoric around all of the great increases that we're seeing with inflation and all of that. That's my understanding is these increases in SPED from the state were mostly eaten up by inflationary increases. The per student amount that is the reimbursement from the state uh, has not been increased by 
um, much. It's not tagged to inflation or anything like that. It's a per student amount. The overall pool of um, uh, those categorical reimbursements is increased by inflation. So transportation, uh, English language proficiency, talent and gifted, uh, those are all increased as part of Amendment 23, right? Base funding plus the categoricals. Um, but as the overall number of students in the state grows, uh, students with special needs, um, that number may or may not keep up with that. Um, it doesn't keep up with the excess costs for uh, highly impacted students, um, which really severely impacts small districts that don't have the resources, the, the staff and the programs to provide services for students where uh, the students have to go to a facility outside their district uh, that can cost tens and up to $100,000 uh, a year. So the $2,500 that uh, the state reimburses is, doesn't quite cut it. Well, and they don't even give us close to inflationary increases on our, cat, our tier two students, correct? Yeah. So this number is still, we're still having to put, at some point it would be interesting to know. The proposal that's out there is a fairly robust increase uh, for next year, if it holds true. So the 40 million, is that the number? But last year they gave us an increase and then applied it across all the categoricals, so it kind of diluted it, didn't yeah. it? Um, any other questions? This is really helpful, Bill. Thank you. Any? Um, so when is our next budget presentation uh, and update? April 18th is the preliminary budget. Um, that will be standard presentation on that. And that'll work be session. Uh, we'll do a work session and a regular session um, presentation on that. Great. Okay. Thank you. So we have one um, action item. Is there a motion to approve our action item personnel items? So moved. Moved by Kitty, seconded by Stacy. We'll wait for Laura. Can you call the roll, please? Garcia. <clears throat> yes. Gephardt. Yes. Nesnick. Yes. Sergeant. Yes. Zess. Yes, motion passes. All right, I hope everyone has a good spring vacation and we'll see everyone in April. Call it, call it in. <laughs> motion to adjourn, Stacy. I move to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>